All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Leadership Bend Television Show with your amazing host, Ricardo D. Rice. And today, we're gonna go a little off the grid today. So this notion of coaches and, and uh, strategists and all these things, all these terms sound great. But when you find somebody that's been doing it for over 20 years, you might wanna pull them in to really get down to the details of what it takes to be a coach. So that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at uh, coaching, this, this segment of coaching. How do you be a coach? What is a coach? All that great stuff. And who better to have than Mrs. Nancy J. Lewis with us on today. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. <laughs> You know, anybody that can can walk in the worlds you've walked in makes me excited because okay. that conversation we had just, just got me all giddy and all worked up. So tell everybody about you, a little bit about your background, all that good stuff. Well, my background, as we talked about earlier, I actually have a healthcare background, and people are really surprised because I'm so far away from healthcare. From actually working as a practitioner, I was a medical technologist, and I specialized in the study of blood. So I know a lot about blood anomalies and all that stuff, but that was like a circle trying to fit in a square. So I realized pretty quickly that that was not really a good suit for me to be in for a long term. So then I moved on to have a lot of different jobs. I mean, very untraditional as a boomer, having lots of jobs. <laughs> so I worked uh, as a Dale Carnegie instructor, part-time teaching public speaking. I was a professor at Georgia State for a couple of years teaching an undergraduate HR course. And then I've been training and speaking for over 24 years as an entrepreneur, helping organizations, as our tagline is, developing a better you, helping organizations work on developing their people, because if your people get it right, your organization's going to be transformed. It's really helping leaders to get transformed, thinking differently, leading differently, especially in this pandemic of how things are being done, mm. helping people strategize, how do you lead now virtually? Because mm. if you were not a good uh, manager or leader before, COVID has really messed you up. <laughs> Literally. like so. And then I've been doing coaching for many years. When you work in HR, I'm an HR professional uh, as well. So when you work in HR, you coach people by default. And so I got into it in a kind of a non-traditional way, but I love helping people because I know I'm an encourager. I help people pull out the greatness inside of them is what I do. Because there's a diamond in everyone. But sometimes you just got to find the diamond so you can, your brilliance can shine the way it needs to shine. Okay. All right. All right. Let's start with public speaking, since that's something you taught. So let, let's start there. What makes us look, <laughs> you, you and I both know that everybody cannot public speak. What makes a good public speaker uh, foundation wise? Like what kind of, uh, I don't want to say personality, because personality is not something no. you can really fix. But what makes a good basis for a public speaker? I think the good basis for a public speaker is that you have to have a message. You have to have a message that connects with your audience. And people don't, people want to sometimes get everything exactly correct. That's good to have a correct message. But if your heart is not there, people don't feel that you've walked this. Sometimes when I share stories about what has happened to me, people are like, oh, really? I'm like, you need to know the real me. Okay, I'm transparent. We're taking the mask off. Not just the one you wear physically. Taking the mask off because you need to know I don't walk on water. Mm. So people need to understand your story because it makes you relatable. Mm. When they realize, okay, you know, you've, you've gone through, I was downsized, but I was downsized before it was popular as we call it, resizing, capsizing, you name the sizing, is happening today. But I was brought in on a Friday afternoon at 4.30, and they told me, clean out my desk, don't come back on Monday, your job's been phased oh, wow. out. I was like, who are you talking to? <laughs> so I was like, um, and they said, you need to clean your desk out, because it was for real. What year are we talking about? Like, what year is this? It was like in the uh, middle, mid to late 80s. Oh, Jesus, that, that's like life or death, so yeah. I tell you that in the 80s. Because it, was, it wasn't, it that was not something that was happening mm. then. And so I had just put on a big conference for the organization. We had a lot of success with it. They brought me in on a Friday and told me at 4.30, clean your desk out. Don't come back. Um, we were going to help you find a new job, which they really didn't. But what it was, it was a lot of experiences, a lot of lessons I learned out of that because uh, at that point in time, I had, a, I mean, making good money, traveling the world. I mean, it was like, it was like the, the ideal job. And in hindsight, when it happened to me, I was like living the good life. I was living in an all adult apartment, very expensive. I'm like, what am I going to do? And so when I began to look for a job, people were telling me you're overqualified. Mm -hmm. We can't hire you. You heard all the different things. I'm like, I'm just trying to get a job. So I went to a facility one day and this was kind of like the, you know, you have those defining moments. This mm -hmm. was a defining moment. I went to this facility to say, I need to get help with um, you know, food, et cetera. What can I get? So basically going to look for, how can I get some, some, some kind of assistance from the, from the state? And the lady said, you need to be looking for a job. And, on, and I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so I was like, I've been looking for a job. But I said, I'm not going to slap this woman. Because that's what I felt like doing. I mean, that's what, because I mean, she's talking to me like I'm, I'm educated. I'm degreed. And I'm just trying to get assistance. I was trying to get a job, but people wouldn't hire me. You're making too much money. You won't be here long. That was a defining Quite moment risk. for me because I said, I can't come back here. So whatever it takes for me to get 
a new job. I got to do it. And what I also learned at that point, because I was so secure in my job, I thought at that time my job would always take care of me. So I wasn't really working to look at doing anything else. And when this happened, I was just kind of like left. I was just left stranded because I'd had no plan. What I learned from that point is you always need to be working on your next opportunity while you're in your current one. And so I worked, began to develop my network and I was able to get a job, but it was a trying time because I really was so comfortable with my job and enjoyed it so much. I was not looking for anything else. And this caught me blindsided because I had not expected this to occur. And so what I tell people now, after that, I began to continue to interview with jobs. Even when I had a good job, I was always looking for who else am I hireable? Am I employable? I want to know what my skill set were because I never want to be put in a situation again where if I was let go, I had no plan. And most people now, you should not be comfortable in your job. If you're comfortable in your job, yeah, that's a mistake. I, I don't know about because it. any given day, they can come in and say, you know, we had a major decision, we made some changes, mm -hmm. we've been acquired, and your job is out. It's all business. It's nothing personal. That's what I had to realize. I didn't realize it then, but I realized it was just business. And so I had to grow from that. There's a lot of other lessons. That's a whole nother story that came out of that that I had to work through as a result of being downsized. But that was before it was popular. But people should not be surprised in today's market. At all. Jobs being phased out. Yes. And so you need to have a plan. So I tell people, while you have your day job, work on your entrepreneurial venture, but also be marketing to see who else would be willing to hire you so that if your job is phased out, you can step into something else. All right, hold that thought, because we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have more Mrs. Nancy J. Lewis on the Leadership Blend television show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. So we're back with our guest, Mrs. Nancy J. Lewis. Glad to have you. Glad to be here. All right. So when we left, I like where you were going. So this notion of marketability, mm -hmm. knowing that if your job is downsized tomorrow, which is happening frequently, yes. as we know, uh, which I have this fight with baby boomers, my parents all the time about uh, the ideology of getting on a job and staying there for 30 years and getting the cactus and the gold watch and your pension. I'm like, that is not the world we live in anymore. Like, that's just not where we are. So... I guess my question is the marketability fact that you were speaking about, still going on interviews, uh, still making sure that people hire you. Let's go back there. And I think to your point, as a boomer, I was a very non-traditional boomer because I had like eight jobs. It's yeah, boomers just don't have jobs. Yeah, they, like don't, they don't have I, I, If I wasn't really happy in a job, I said, you know what? I need to find something else. So once I got downsized, I changed jobs a lot. So <laughs> and then eventually I left and started my own business. So I am not your traditional boomer. So wait. Because the notion of gaps, uh, spaces and gaps, because I'm assuming if you went to these jobs like that, you probably didn't stay all that long. No, I did. So how did you explain that when you got interviewed for another job? But see, my style of who I am is like I'm very direct, and I'm kind of like when you hire me, what you see in the interview is what you get when you bring me on. So I don't temper who I am. So I let you know that I am very confident who I am. I know what I bring to the table, and I'm going to be a good, do a good job for you. And if you decide you want to bring me on, I'm going to be with you, but I'm not coming to retire. I told one client, that, you, know, <laughs> you in, told them that? In Andrew, I said, I'm not coming here to retire. I'm going to pass through, but I'm going to give you the best of me when I'm here. What's the response to that? They just like, oh, okay. And they hired me. Because I want to see the thing is, as an HR person, what people do sometimes in the interview is they sell, you buy something that you didn't know you were buying. Mm. The person's in the interview say, oh, I'm going to do this and I'll be able to do this. And they're, yeah, they're so laid back, whatever. I'm just a good team player. I want to do a good job. So I just want to be able to help your organization get better. Then you hire them. You're like, who is this? <laughs> Literally. Who is this? Literally. So what you get in the interview, and I tell you, you have to be true to your authentic self. As I told you, you can do you because everybody else is taken. That's one of my Nancyisms. <laughs> a Nancyism. Yeah, I call it Nancy. I did a book on Nancyism, an ebook on Nancyisms, because people say you need to put it in a little ebook. So I have an ebook on Amazon with Nancyisms, because it's like do you because everybody else is taken. You can be a first rate you or second rate somebody else, and it's about being your authentic self because it reduces your stress level. See, when you try to be somebody else, you get stressed out because you, you got to remember how you behave. That's too much work. <laughs> too much work. <laughs> Be, just be true to yourself. Be your authentic self. Show up your authentic self consistently. This is what people are looking for. So when you go for the interview, show up as to who you are, being who you are, realizing sometimes you may not be the best person for the job, but you have to show up authentically. That's what people have to do because people are not doing that because they want a job. So when you bring them on board, you're like, who did we get here? Who is this person? <laughs> And so I think the marketability, you have to know how marketable. That's why you have to continue to invest in yourself. During this pandemic, if you've not learned something new, shame on you. 
That is very true. I've taken several courses, got certified in a lot of things because I'm continuing to grow. I tell my clients, you must grow. I have to practice what I teach other people. And so in this pandemic, if you've not learned a new skill, something, a class, because there's classes you can take for management and development that are free. So there's things like that that you can get that are free that will help you in invest in you, but you gotta be willing to invest in you to become more marketable. Why would I hire you and you've not learned anything new in the last five years and you've learned 10 things? Who's more marketable? The more you, that's why I tell people sometimes when I work with a lot of my clients, even if you can't get promoted, if you can do a lateral move and you learn something new, it's increasing the breadth and depth of your experience and your knowledge for the organization. Okay, so in that space, because there's this question of liability, the notion that the more you get, the more you're going to ask for financially. How do you stay in the middle space? Because, you know, that's the issue. <clears throat> People look at your list of accomplishments and go, well, yeah, we would love to have you, but if we get you, we're going to have to pay you 80000 when I can get uh, Kim over here who just graduated from school and I can pay her fifty, and we can make up the difference. So how do you stay right in the middle? So I think you have to. They always say when I worked in HR, the person who brings up money first loses. Hmm. So typically, sometimes they'll ask you, so what are you looking for in a salary? And people say, well, I'm looking for uh, whatever the number is. And so you say a number that maybe is $20,000 less than what they were. They were willing to pay more. They're not going to go up. You can always negotiate down. You can never negotiate up. Hmm. Okay. So you always, if you say, well, I was looking for a job that would pay $30,000, they are like, we were going to offer her forty, but we don't even have to. They're not going to say, oh, we have another ten grand for you on the table. Please. <laughs> they do. I need to go to that job. Yeah, they're very generous. They're, they're not going to do generous. that. So you have to realize sometimes it may not be a good fit because tell people just because you don't value what I bring does not mean that it's not a value. Hmm. And so it depends on where you are. You have to look at your situation. Every situation is unique and different. If you're trying to put food on the table for your family, there are certain things you may have to compromise based on where you are in life at that specific time. So sometimes you will have to make some concessions because you need X, Y, Z. But sometimes you have to say, I've had to walk away and say, you know, because people say sometimes when they want to hire me, well, I didn't really have a budget. And I said, well, let me refer some of my free friends, okay? <laughs> the scary part is I can see you saying that. That's the scary part. I, I can like, see you yeah, saying that to I somebody. Because I said, well, you know, um, we didn't really have a budget for that. I said, so you didn't have a budget for training? I'm like, I, I understand. I said, you placed value what you thought was important. I said, but I can't come. What you asked me to do? I can't come and do this for free. So I'll just refer somebody who doesn't charge or maybe it's more in your price point. And you know, when you find the money for something going forward, please keep me in mind. And some people call back, they found the money. <laughs> how soon? Like how, how, like how within soon? Within about a week. <laughs> so you have the money to begin with. Here's what I'm going to part with it. But you were just trying to see if you could basically pimp me, cause I'm keeping it real, to come in here and get, do less. Because when you realize as an entrepreneur, people don't value what's free, first of all. When it's free, people will sign up and say they're coming to something, and if they don't show up... Okay, hold on, because I know you're getting ready to go, and I want a full segment of that. So we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about this on The Leadership Band with your television host, Ricardo D. Rice. Okay, we had to take a break because this one right here was getting ready to go all in and all out. So I had to stop her and take a break because we just wouldn't have had one. All right, so what she was getting ready to go into is this notion of entrepreneurship being discounted or given for free uh, in the hopes of building clientele or in the hopes of getting your foot in the door. So speak to that. Okay, so it is real. It is important to do stuff for free. I do stuff for free. There, there, there is, that's a part of what we do as entrepreneurs. But if you do everything for free, you have a hobby. You don't have a business. Oh. Be clear on that. And so what you have to be mindful of, sometimes people that you think would really be willing to pour into you and bless you, sometimes they're looking for stuff for free. And free sometimes I do, like I so said, you do it strategically because sometimes it can align you, it can open up doors. I've done free stuff that I've gotten some serious clients off of. But it's very strategic. If I'm doing something free, I'm looking, okay, first of all, I'm praying about, should I do this, first of all? Mm. Cause I'm a praying woman. I'm like, should I do this? And if I don't get a clearance to do it, I'm like, I'm not going to do it. If I'm, if the Lord says, go ahead, then I'm gonna do it. Cause I know it's for somebody there. There's a message for somebody or there's a, I'm supposed to bless someone with just the words I'm sharing, or there's going to be something that's going to happen as a result of that. So sometimes you just have to pay it forward and do some stuff free, but you have to be very strategic. You cannot do everything for free. You can't do events for free. One of the first lessons I learned when I was doing a women's empowerment conference, the first year we did it, a lot of my friends said, girl, I got you. I'm coming. Mm. And so, I, you know, I'm like, okay, great. So I guarantee for people, because I, these are my friends. These are my colleagues. These are my, these are my friends. They will be there. Cause that's what I thought. Cause mm. they said, I'm going to be there. Count me in. You know, I'm going to be there. 
So the day of the event, uh, half the people did not come because it was raining in Atlanta. You know how it is in Atlanta. Oh, yeah, it's it started raining. raining. On yeah, a nobody, Friday. Oh, and it was on a Friday? It was a Friday. Oh, yeah, that was, you was, that so was, was, like, was out. So they, so they didn't come. There was no skin in the game. So I said, you know what? But I had to eat because they don't care if you guarantee for 50 and 20 come. You still they don't paying. Care. You still paying for 50. Mm-hmm. So it was a monetary lesson learned that if you have not hit the pay button, you don't count. Okay? And if you, there's no skin in the game, if it's free, if you've not paid for it, there's no skin in the game. So if it's raining outside on a Friday or Monday, you're like, I don't feel like driving downtown Atlanta. It's too much. You're not going to come because you have not invested. One time I had invested and bought a ticket for an event. I think it was like $70 or $75. It was, a, it was a Thursday, I think it was, Thursday afternoon. It was way on the north side of town. I live south of Atlanta. <laughs> but I paid for that ticket myself. And I was like, I really don't want to go. I said, but I'm not about to get this money away and not show up. So I drove all the way there because I had skin in the game. Mm. If the ticket had been given to me, I might have not have gone because I didn't have invested interest, but I had paid for it myself with my hard earned dollars. So I drove myself there and went to the event. So you have to be really careful when you start doing free things. It's nothing wrong with doing free things, especially if you want to get out in front of a certain group. You want to give a new message that you want to try out. You want to sample it and really test it because it's really for you. You want to talk about this message in front of this group to get some feedback on how they're going to feel about it so you can take it to other venues. So it's it's a great way to segue and try new things for you in that respect. But you cannot do everything for free because you do not have a business. You have a hobby. You cannot pay your mortgage on IOU. So what do you think keeps entrepreneurs in that free space? Some of them are afraid to ask for money because they're, what I learned earlier on, one I was um, back in the day when I first started, I was working with a client, wanted to work with a client. And I, they asked me what, how much money I wanted to make for the presentation. And I told him, and he actually, he came to me offline and said, you're too cheap. He said, that's why you didn't get it. He said, they, they don't feel you can add value because of what you're charging. And I was like, what? So sometimes people expect you to be willing to say, you have to say your price. I sometimes coach people and get them comfortable saying their price. Because some people are like, well, I'm afraid. No, this is what you do. This is what my charge is. Okay. You just have to be comfortable with what you bring to the, this is what I bring to the table. You get all of me. Yeah. But okay. So with that same vein though, there's like this space of cockiness and overpricing versus actually being worth you say you're worth. How do you know when I, you're in that right space? You just, you know, if you need to talk to some of your colleagues in the space to find out what they're charging, to get a sense of K. Because someone who has 20 years is charging one number. Someone who's charging maybe 10, maybe charging less because of just their experience. Hmm. And it depends on who you work with. If you work with a lot of major organizations like I have, I work with some major organizations, Fortune 500, Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies, government agencies. So I have a tremendous, and I'm very blessed to have a very tremendous uh, client list, great client list. So who you work with also dictates sometimes what you can ask for. You can't say I work for, you know, this group over here. You know, like, who are they? <laughs> you know, I speak here, you know, I've done some stuff with my little league group. You know, that's all well and good. But when people start, when you start getting into the big leagues, when you talk about working with corporations and government agencies, where they're putting their stamp of approval on you, first of all, when you, they bring you in, whoever brings you in, their name is on the, they're, they're on the line for you to be able to deliver. This is true. And so you have to basically sometimes do like a, a gauge in terms of what people that are in that space, what are they charging? And then what you have to decide, okay, based on what I'm bringing to the table, based on my experience, what, what, what am I comfortable asking for? And then sometimes you have to ask for that. And you have to sometimes be willing to negotiate because sometimes, you know what, we didn't have 5,000. We had 4,000. So you say, okay, well, you just don't get all this. You don't get the buffet. We just take a couple things off the buffet. That's all. <laughs> We're not adding a salad bar. You just get straight food. But you, we, have, but you, have, realize, there's, you have to have some, you have to be willing to negotiate because I've negotiated sometimes in terms of what I've asked for. And they said, you know, we can't meet that. I said, because I'm very creative. People call me for just creativity. I'm like, okay, they didn't have this. What can I ask for? I'm real creative. <laughs> So I can find a way, we can find some, we can find some ways, but you have to be willing to sometimes recognize sometimes you are, sometimes you're going to be too pricey for some people. They're just not going to be able to afford you. That's true. But sometimes it takes the same amount of marketing effort to market it to 50 people as it does to five. That's good. Because if I'm going to, if I'm get five people who can pay me X, Y, Z, and I got to get 50 who pay me this, I'm much, it's much easier to do yeah, five. Yeah, to do five. Because you're spending, you're, you're spending the same amount of energy, whether it's five or 500, you're spending the same amount of marketing energy. So why not really work on Asking for what you know you're worth. There's somebody that people pay for what they value. I'm, I've learned that. Because when I'm people say, that. well, you know, it's too high. I said, no, it's just that you don't place value on it. And I'm good. I'm okay with that. Because if you want to get whatever it is that you want to do, wherever you want to go, you will find the resources to make it happen. So when people give me that money, like, it just shows me that that's not a value for you. And it's, well, I'm good. Have a great day. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take our last break. And when we come back, we're going to tie all this in together and say, so now you feel like you're a coach. What do you do? So stick around the Leadership and Television Show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice.
Okay. You try to say stuff off camera. I need you to say stuff off camera. You try to say it off. I need you to say it on. You can tell me later on, but I want you to share that now. Okay, so tell me what you did ready to tell me about the. So what when we first when I first started training, you know, people always said, "Well, you you charge so much." I said, "For for as speakers and presenters, there's a lot of prep time you do outside." reading articles, books, et cetera, just researching, trying to find out stuff that's relevant for whatever group you're talking to, what's making it relatable, relevant for you to be able to bring that, that message home. So they estimated, when I was working with one of my colleagues, he said for every hour of standing up, pre presenting, he spent roughly eight hours of basically prep time looking for something to, for that one eight hour. For that one hour, he spent about eight hours working to get that stuff to get that one hour. So that becomes very costly. If you charge people for what you actually spend in researching things, because sometimes I spend, a, I spend sometimes a couple of days looking for stuff, for the right stuff for a client, because it's that important to me. Now, I don't bill them for all that, but I do factor in when I'm working with them. There is a preparation. There is a design and development phase that they're charged. I'm clear on that. You get charged for design and de development. What else do you charge for? Like, what else do, outside of that, what else is something you there should consider? A, well, basically the customer, because you're customizing sometimes in terms mm -hmm. of that. And sometimes you're adding, you're doing, the, you're doing the design and development, you're doing the delivery, and sometimes you're doing consultation after that because they need you to, you need to write up something. Oh, that's your time. Is this true? So when you're writing up something, if you do something for a group and they say, we want to get a summary of what you think happened as a result of training all of our people, that's consulting dollars. So you have to factor all that in and also expenses in terms of when I travel, like I just sent a proposal to a client last night. I gave him the fee, but then I said expenses, that's airfare, that's hotel, that's accommodation, that's incidentals, that's everything. I'm not paying for anything. <laughs> well, I mean, they want you, you shouldn't. So it's like, but you, tell me you have to spell it out because if you leave stuff out, and there have been times I've given the wrong price to a client. I had to eat it because it's my integrity. So I've learned sometimes I'll tell people, no, I need to find out what you're trying to do. Because if people say, well, what, what are you charging? What are you looking for? Because see, sometimes it's like you're just shopping. <laughs> I, I'm not going to just throw some numbers out there. I need to know what specifically are you looking for? Because you can, I mean, there is an issue. Something's happened in your organization that you need, you feel you need my services. So what happened? So we need to back it up. So sometimes you got to ask more questions before. I'm sorry, I don't just throw out a price. No, I need to find out what's going on for you and how I can help you. So let's talk about what, what drove you to me. Okay. Let's let's talk. Let's go there. What what made you reach out to me? There's something that happened that made you think you needed to talk to me. What was that? And then let's go dive deeper. You go deeper. So then, as you go deeper, you begin to see some stuff un stuff getting unlayered, and you just say, "Okay, cha ching," because you know, this is cha ching. <laughs> there's some issues you're gonna help them with, but you build off of that. So I'm not like always that. just giving the initial fee because, okay, well, first of all, what are you what are you trying to accomplish? So see, that actually sounds like an actual consultation because mm -hmm. most people are like, we have a consultation, they just get on the phone and say, well, I charge $500 and blah, blah, blah. That actually sounds like a consultation. I want to know the layers. Why are you coming to me? Yes. I actually like that. All right, good. So that all ties into, <laughs> that all ties into, so I've done all these things. <laughs> And now I've decided from my experience that I am ready to coach somebody to not go through the things that I've gone through or to help them be their better mm -hmm. selves. What does coaching mean to you? Coaching means to me that you are someone, because you know you have life coaching, you mm -hmm. have executive business coaching, you have career coaching, you have you know, almost any leadership coaching, you have almost any kind of coaching you want to name it, it's out there now. Mm -hmm. But I think what has to happen is that sometimes you have to get some credentials that will also, it's, the coaching industry is not really, it's there are organizations that sanction that you have gone through X, Y, Z, and they put their stamp on you. So it's not like a real sanctioning for a coach. People yeah. can become a coach. They can just say, you know, I coach how to bake cakes. So I'm a coach. I'm a baker coach. You know, <laughs> I mean, whatever it is. I'm just saying that's, that's how much the latitude is. If you're looking to actually get clients and to get reputable clients and people that are going to pay you, you're going to have to have some kind of certification, something that goes with the whether it's ICF, International Coaching Federation. I went through the Registered Co Coaching Program, Registered Corporate Coach Program several years ago. There's different programs out there that you can go to to get a certification that gives you a stamp that you've gone through a series of, let's say, academic things that help you to know how to prepare things to do in the coaching process. They legitimized me because one of my clients, they had to see something that I had done for them to bring me in to help with their employees. They needed some kind of certification. So I had my RCC, which is my registered corporate coach, credentials behind my name. Plus, I worked as an HR person for many years. So I did coaching by default in HR because you coach people by default when you work in HR. Uh, yeah. Uh, so but people that. just becoming coaches because they think they want to be a coach. The question is, who's going to hire you? First of all, who's going to pay you? I had a lady uh, a couple weeks ago on LinkedIn. She sent me a LinkedIn message. And say it, is your coaching free? If it's not, I can't participate. That was a message? She said, I just want to let you know, because she had inquired about coaching. She said, and then she came back and said, is your coaching free? She said, if not, I can't, I can't work with you. 
So I had to pause because I didn't respond that day. I, I probably I probably wouldn't either because that right so there. I yeah. just, and she had an all caps. Oh, see, that's, yeah. That's, she, she had an all caps. Now you put some reflection on your wording. So a, when I responded the next day, I said in all caps, it is not free, dot, dot, dot. Now put in lowercase, but I wish you much success in your career, Coach Nancy. <laughs> Did she respond? No, she didn't respond to that because it's like, no, she didn't. Because it's like, no, do you think... Do, do you think it's going to be free? I mean, now people, some people may do it for free because they're trying to get started. Mm -hmm. And I'm not knocking that. But you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. When you get me, you get all of my credentials. You get everything I've learned. You get the ministry side. You get the you get the things I've learned at HR, Dale Carnegie. You get the whole thing. I can't hold anything back from you. And I want you to succeed because I want you to tell other people. So if you like what I do, you're going to tell your colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that's how I get a lot of repeat business. They say, you need to work with her. She, do, mm -hmm. she will tell you the real deal. I'm not going to temper what I say to you. I'm going to do it in love. I'm going to let you know that's not something you might want to go down this path right now because you don't really, you're not wired for that right now. You need X, Y, Z first. How about looking at this? So I'm going to tell you what I see. I can't mandate. I'm just your accountability partner. I'm your person who's there that you talk to. Sometimes I'm your confidence. Some people say, you're my therapist, whatever you want me to be. That's who I am. Because <laughs> I'm some people's therapist doing all this stuff. I've been some people's therapist. I mean, they just, I just, oh, I just need you to get it out. Whatever you need for that session, it's your session to make you become better. But people are now, everyone's a coach now. Everyone's consultant, a coach, their speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you just come out here. And so sometimes what happens, you come into the industry and you cheapen the industry because you come in and you're doing stuff for so such a low price. And it's not necessarily the quality is not there, but it impacts other people. And so people now are really reluctant sometimes. I don't bring people in unless I know that you bring the goods because I got burnt early in my career. I brought a colleague in who I thought was at the same level that I was working with and in and he was not and the client called me and said don't bring him again he's not where you are oh and so i learned so i you have to be vetted i have to pray and say okay because again my name is attached to it mm -hmm. if i bring you in or i give you a, one of my clients one of my good clients you come in and you bomb out that is a reflection on me mm -hmm. and so that might impact me for getting future business or being able to recommend anybody else so i get that so i tell people be very careful when you start recommending people to come in as a coach or whatever, make sure, or whatever you are asking them to do, vet them to make sure they can actually deliver. If they can deliver, be a door opener for them. Pay it forward. But if you don't know if they can, be careful because it can come back to haunt you in terms of your career, your business, and your trajectory, especially in the marketplace. True words, true words. Okay, so I can't even get anything because we're out of time. So I can't even get anything. I was about to bring you back, which I should have known <laughs> yeah. that this was not going to be long enough. But, you know, it's good. Okay, so how do we get in touch with you? People can get in contact with me. They can reach out to me. Nancy J. Lewis, uh, LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, Nancy J. Lewis. And you'll find me. I do lots of stuff on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me at 770-964-5533. That's 770-964-5533. Or you can email me at nancy at Progressive Techniques, Inc. That's I-N-C dot com. Nancy at Progressive Techniques, Inc. dot com. And so I'd be happy to talk with you more and explore how I can work with you and help you to be the best you can be. <laughs> You have it down to the science. It's so cute. All right. Um, final nuggets. Any nuggets you want to leave with somebody who is uh, listening and now they're like, you know what? Mm, I still think I want to be a coach, though. Any nuggets you want to leave for them? And it's, it's nothing wrong with still wanting to be a coach, but sometimes look at, okay, what credentials? There's a lot of options out there. When you, there's a lot of options for you to, to select from for giving you some coaching credentials, some coaching nuggets that will help you certify that I want to bring you in. I want to hire you. And more importantly, I'm willing to pay you. Because you want to get paid. So having the credentials behind your name opens up the door for you getting paid more. Mm. And so one thing I would also say is, is, is a coach and as a business professional, as one of my coaching clients told me in a session I was doing with her about a month ago, stop expecting you from other people. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that lesson early on. Because sometimes we expect things from other people that, because the way we do things, we want them to do it. Mm -hmm. Understand, everyone you work with, if you work with a coach, one coach is going to be different. Their style may be different from somebody else's style. You have to sometimes, the personality, sometimes you have to feel, okay, I'm not feeling this. I don't think this is a good fit. And sometimes you have to part ways. Do not, when, as my angel says, when people show you who they are, believe them. Yes. If you don't feel that this is the right time and this is not the person for you, they're going to be helping you with your career. Sometimes you have to just say, you know what, let me just keep looking because I think I don't know if this is a good fit and be okay with that. So I just tell people, be authentically who you are, be intentional, be focused. And when you get the opportunity to pay it forward, pay it forward. I don't think you need to say anything else. That, that's a good ending point right there. All right. So special thanks to our guest today, Mrs. Nancy J. Lewis. Thank you so much for being thank with us. Thank you for having me. I'm going to have to put you on the podcast. I'm going to bring you back. You spill it too much. I can't get it all in one <laughs> sitting. All right. So we will see you guys next Monday. Same time, same place on the Leadership Bend television show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice.